Hello everyone, in this lecture we will look at how our body could adjust and adapt to exercise. Before we proceed, let's come back to this brain teaser that I released in the previous lecture. So assuming this couple had perfect mouth to mouth transfer and there were no leak of air in between exchanges, what are the possible tricks you can help them to extend their time underwater? So first of all, let's consider about this. Do they need a higher oxygen loading rate or a higher oxygen dissociation rate? Yes, it should be a higher oxygen loading rate because they will need maximum transfer of oxygen from one person to another. And they do not need a higher oxygen dissociation rate because they are not undergoing heavy physical exercise over here. So now if they need a higher oxygen loading rate, should the temperature go higher or lower? The answer is lower so that the oxygen saturation curve will shift towards left hand side and that increases hemoglobin affinity for oxygen. But can the temperature be too low? Definitely no because they will cause hypothermia or the loss of body temperature that can lead to increased metabolic needs or in other words more oxygen consumption. So probably you can suggest to Nicolay and uh, his wife to experiment on a set of cooler temperatures and see which one is the optimum temperature. Now, how about the depth of the water? Should it be deeper or shallower? Now, if you want a higher oxygen saturation, you will need a higher PO2 level or a higher oxygen partial pressure. So which one has a higher pressure? Is it deeper or shallower? Well, the answer is deeper because you get the pressure from atmosphere plus the pressure from the water. In other words, when you go deeper, you will have a higher PO2 level. But again, you need to experiment on this because being too deep will introduce too much pressure on the chest and that will impair the ability to breathe smoothly. While the last one is pretty straightforward. Do you need more hemoglobin or less? And of course, the answer is more. But how should you increase the hemoglobin amount in your body? Well, as I mentioned in my last lecture, they can train in a place with a higher altitude. So with that, you can boost more red blood cells production. And these are the learning outcomes for this session. Number one, to explain how and to what degree the cardiovascular and the respiratory activities are altered to reflect the particular demands during exercise. Number two, to describe the actual mechanisms by which cardiovascular and respiratory systems doing adjustments. In the first section, we'll look at ventilatory responses to exercise, or in other words, how does our respiration change in response to exercise. We'll look at how oxygen consumption is correlated to the intensity of exercise and how can we improve our oxygen consumption by having training. Then we'll look at some changes with regards to lung volume, which is known as tidal volume during exercise. And we'll look at the control of respiration, which can be achieved by either chemical stimulation or the neural stimulation. So what happens with a ventilation during exercise? Well, it increases. And here is a breakdown of what happens during exercise. First of all, you will get an increase in the tidal volume which is defined as the volume of air displaced in between inhalation and exhalation. So for normal people, the increase in tidal volume can be up to tenfold, but it could be as high as 20-fold for athletes. And with a higher volume, you get more oxygen supply to oxygenate the red blood cells. But it isn't just the volume that's being increased, you also get an increase in the ventilation rate. So we normally breathe 12 times per minute but during exercise the frequency can be as high as 45 to 50 breathers per minute again this bring in more oxygen to meet the demand and you also get an increased diffusion capacity of oxygen in your alveoli due to increased blood flow through your lungs and tissues so that is made possible by increased systolic blood pressure which is the pressure in your arteries when the ventricles contract and you will get a higher or more optimized blood flow distribution. 
So collectively, these are the factors that impose a limit on your respiratory adaptation to exercise. If you could enhance one or more of these factors, you will get better performance in exercise. Okay, here is a quick look to the tidal volume. Please ignore all these jargons for the moment and just focus on the tidal volume or TV. It is the lung volume representing the normal volume of air displaced in between normal inhalation and normal exhalation when extra effort is not applied. So it is known as tidal volume for a reason. As we inhale, our lung volume goes up. As we exhale, the volume goes down. So as long as we are breathing, it forms a tidal wave graph pattern. So do take note that the volume here is in ml per kg. So if you are 50 kilogram, so times 50 with this value, you will get a rough estimate of your tidal volume. So when we are at rest, the tidal volume is about 7 ml per kg. But this volume can increase by tenfold during exercise. And if you are a trained athlete, that volume can be increased by 20 folds even. So upon rest, this tidal volume will eventually come back to the background level. And here is the question, how do we measure or quantify the impact of exercise upon respiration? If you look at the previous diagram, both the intensity and the duration of the exercise are not defined. So we can't really do a fair comparison in between different individuals or across different types of activities. So what do we do? We plot a curve of VO2 versus work rate. So VO2 stands for the rate of oxygen consumption. It is measured in the units of milliliter of oxygen consumed per minute of activity per kilogram of body weight. While on the x-axis, we measure the intensity of exercise in terms of power or wattage. As the intensity of the exercise increases, so does the VO2 up to a maximum point known as the VO2 max or the maximum oxygen consumption. Then it quickly falls when you have an oxygen depth due to anaerobic respiration. You also need the time to clear your lactic acid production during anaerobic respiration. So in short, the intensity of exercise is directly related to VO2. And although we know that VO2 or VO2 max is largely determined by your genes, but it can be improved by training. If you look at the VO2 max values among the elite athletes, you will see that there is definitely a correlation between their VO2 max and performance in sports. And to date, the record breaker is Oscar Swenson, who has a VO2 max of close to 100. So this value of VO2 max is almost twice the amount of the values of ordinary people like us. So for the age group in between 20 to 29 year old, depending if you are male or female, your VO2 max should be about 40 to 50 or 30 to 40. And you could also see that from this list, most people are endurance athletes, such as cyclists, skiers, or the marathon runners. So why is it so? That's because these activities are all very demanding in terms of oxygen consumption. And showing here is just an example how professional athletes like a cyclist would test their VO2 max. They need to exercise as hard as possible, pushing their limits until they could detect the curve or the peak in the curve. So it is not something that is enjoyable. In fact, it is a very painful process. So if you are a runner, then you will do the same test, not on a bike, but on a treadmill. To put you into perspective, animals like the thoroughbred horse used in horse racing has a much higher VO2 max than human at 180. So, so that is twice the amount of the highest record breaker for human. Now huskies, on the other hand, has a much higher VO2 max as high as 240. So if you own a husky, never expect to outrun them. But the question is, how about you? If you really want to know your VO2 max, but couldn't afford a professional test, this is what you can do. It is called a 12 minute test or a Cooper's test. So what you do in this test is that you have to run like there's no tomorrow and run as fast as possible for 12 minutes and then record the distance. 
So I believe you could use an app, smartphone app to track your distance, then key in the distance into this program, which you can assess from this website, and then it will tell you your VO2 max value. And next, we'll look at the relationship in between work rate and minute ventilation, which measures the volume of air breathed in and out in a minute. And it is measured in the unit of liter per minute. As similar to the previous diagram, you will see a linear relationship in between work rate or the intensity of exercise versus minute ventilation. Here is when you have your aerobic respiration as usual. But at about 70% of your maximum oxygen consumption, you will see a sharp spike in terms of minute ventilation. Here is when you start entering anaerobic respiration. And with that, you will have lactic acid production. So the point by which you switch onto anaerobic respiration is called the lactate, the lactate threshold because you start accumulating lactic acid in your body up to a maximum point the minute ventilation will take a sharp fall. That's because you have to slow down to clear off all the acids and to pay off the oxygen debt during anaerobic respiration. So I hope by now you can see that how oxygen delivery limits your performance in exercise. However, the real limit is not because of gas exchange in your lungs or the oxidative metabolism in your tissues or cells, rather it is your cardiac output. So we can always get enough oxygen from our lungs but the cardiac output can increase indefinitely, which means in other words, you have problem in sending those oxygenated blood from the lungs across your body, especially to the tissues like your muscle tissues. So what athletes trend for is to have a larger VO2 max so that they get a bigger aerobic window before lactic acid threshold is arrived. So, the ventilatory responses to exercise is complex. As you begin to exercise, you will get an immediate boost in terms of your ventilation. And that is known as the feed forward reflex, as it happens prior to any changes in PO2 or PCO2 level. And to make this possible, you will need the pro-prior septors in your muscles and joints, which detect motion which means as soon as you start moving, that motion will be sensed by the receptors. That will send a signal to your respiratory center, which boosts your ventilation. While in stage two of exercise, the higher level of ventilation is regulated by both peripheral and the central chemoreceptors that detect any changes in PCO2 level. And it is also thought that the potassium ion may be another signal that can be sensed by these receptors. Last but not least, when you stop exercise, your ventilation rate will remain elevated until all ATP and CP, which stands for creatinine phosphate, are returned to normal. So for your information, CP or creatinine phosphate is the molecule that will provide phosphate group to re relate ADP back into ATP. And let's try to put everything together. As we start exercise, the oxygen consumption or VO2 increases up to the maximum oxygen consumption, or we call it VO2 max. At the same time, your ventilation or your breathing will also increase to support the extra oxygen demand. But at about 70% of your VO2 max, you will see a sharp spike of ventilation, which we call hyperventilation. Here is when you will switch on the anaerobic respiration with the production of lactic acid. And that explains why you will see a sharp drop of arterial pH passing the 70% of VO2 max. Now for the venous PO2, it is always dropping gradually with increased exercise intensity. That's because your cells or your tissues will use more oxygen with a higher level of exercise intensity. And as for the arterial pCO2, it will take a slight dip passing the point of 70% of VO2 max. That's because after this point, you have hyperventilation, which means you breathe in more oxygen, but at the same time, you also breathe out more carbon dioxide. And therefore, the PCO2 level is dropping, passing the point of 70% VO2 max. But what I want to draw your attention is to this arterial PO2 level, 
because it is always constant at about 100 millimeter mercury level. Why is it so? Okay, first of all, it means that your oxygen level in the arteries is always maximum in any point of your exercise. Therefore, oxygen supply is not limited by your respiratory system, but instead it is by your cardiac output because your heart may not be pumping fast enough to send all those oxygen around the body. To summarize, ventilatory response is modulated by multiple reflex systems, such as the feet for reflex system that get your body ready for exercise. And it functions through your motor sensors, aka your proprioceptors in the muscles and joints that detect motion. And you also get the feedback reflexes that function through your chemoreceptors that detect mainly the PCO2 level so that you will get synchronized cardiac output. And as a result, these parameters are always modulated during exercise. In fact, the feed forward reflex is a form of neural stimulation, while the feedback reflex is a form of chemical stimulation.